While the engines can be described as a heart of an airplane, it is the avionics that provide the brain power. If you are planning to study ATI systems, or if you are just curious about what kind of avionics passenger aircraft have, then this is the right video for you. Hi, my name is Magnar Nordahl. I'm an ATI typewriting instructor and captain. And this channel is all about aviation. Almost everything that happens to an airplane is registered, analyzed and presented to the pilots on their instruments. When you study aircraft systems, you will often find references to other systems and especially the avionics. Therefore, you may find it useful to watch this video before you start studying other ATR systems. ATR aircraft have two different cockpit layouts, AFIS, also called the Legacy, and the glass cockpit, or the new avionic suite, which was introduced to the 600 variant. AFIS stands for Electronic Flight Information System and consists of two CRT screens in front of each pilot, together with traditional clock style instruments. Each pilot has an identical set of six flight instruments, airspeed indicator, electronic artificial direction indicator, or artificial horizon, altitude indicator, RMI, electronic HSI, and VSI. On the center panel, there are system indicators for the engines, landing gear and pressurization systems, and a few other things. On the pedestal, we have GPS, control panel for weather radar, parking brake, engine controls, flaps lever, radio controls and trim controls. On the glare shield we have the controls for the autopilot. On the overhead panel we have controls for all of the other systems. And circuit breakers, lots of circuit breakers. And there are even more of them behind the first officer seat. The 600 variants have a glass cockpit consisting of five LCD screens. The heart of the system are two core avionic cabinets, CAC number one and CAC number two. They do a lot of processing and replace some functions otherwise performed by separate computers in all the ATR variants. The instrument panel is very different from the previous models. There are five LCD screens called display units. They are fully interchangeable and it's the location that defines the function. The outer screens are called PFD, or Primary Flight Display, and they replace the six flight instruments seen in the early ATR variants. Next to the PFD is the MFD, Multifunction Display. It can show a large map, the navigation display, or four pages with the status of most systems, and a performance page for calculations linked to the FMS. The lower part of the screens is used to control radios, navigation equipment, transponder and TCAS with the help of a keyboard. In the middle we find the EWD, the engine warning display. The upper part shows primary engine parameters, trims, flaps, time, fuel on board and the gross weight of the aircraft. The lower part is used by the flight warning system and electronic checklists. The pedestal has control for the FMS and the display units. The glare shield has a new control panel for the autopilot. The overhead panel and the circuit breaker panels are pretty much the same. Now, let's have a look at the computers. We have two ADC air data computers and they are connected to pitot tubes, static ports and air temperature sensors. They provide airspeed, altitude, vertical rate and temperature to the flight instruments and other systems such as the engines, autopilot and the ice protection system. We have two HSRS, attitude heading reference systems. They provide attitude and heading information to the flight instruments. Each HSRS consists of three gyros and three accelerometers installed in a box placed under the forward cabin floor. Magnetic heading information is provided by flux valves in each wingtip. 
Communication is provided by VHF Radio, Transponder Mode Sierra. As an option, you can add HF Radio and Cell Call. Navigation is provided by GPS, VOR, ILS, DME, Marker, ADF, TCAS, Radio Altimeter, Weather Radar, and Enhanced Ground Proximity Warning System. Optionally, you can add Inertial Reference System, or IRS which allows for curved RMP approaches. The first ATR42 variants, the 300 and the 320, have many small computers controlling various systems, such as landing gear extension, retraction, propeller anti-icing heating cycles, hydraulic pumps, and much more. The ATR72 brought a change to this with the introduction of the MFC, the multifunction computer. The MFC replaces many of those small computers found in the ATR 42300 and 320 and has the benefit of better redundancy. There are two MFCs, MFC1 and MFC2, and each MFC has two modules, A and B, and they operate independently of each other. Therefore, we have four modules, they are all independent, they are MFC1A, 1B, 2A and 2B. For example, when the ATR42300 relies on a single computer to get the landing gear down, there are two MFC modules with that function. They are MFC1A and 2A. Only one of them needs to work to get the landing gear down in a normal way. Therefore, the MFC provides better redundancy. The MFC also monitors system failures and flight abnormalities and gives alerts to the pilots when a corrective action is required. In ATI variants with the EFIS cockpit, this function is called the CCAS, the Centralized Crew Alert System. In ATI variants with the glass cockpit, it's called the Flight Warning System, FWS. The CCAS triggers oral and visual alerts, helping the pilots to identify the problem and take corrective action. The CCAS trigger alerts for fire, smoke, system failure, system degradation, and dangerous flight condition, for example, you're flying too fast. There are four levels of alerts. Number one is warnings, for example, engine fire. Two, cautions, for example, a generator failure. Three, advisories, for example, that the parking brake is on and for information, for example, that DME hold is active. Here is an example of a condition that requires immediate action from the crew. Loss of engine oil pressure. We get CRC, continuous repetitive chime, flashing master warning light, engine oil on the cap, crew alert panel, an oil pressure indicator has a red light and indicates less than 40 psi. And the procedure for this condition is found in the quick reference handbook. Here is an example of a system failure. This again rate default. We get a single chime, flashing monster caution light, a leak on the crew alert panel, the cap, and an amber fault light on the generator push button. And again, the procedure is found in the Quick Reference Handbook. ATR600 variants have a flight warning system, which is an integrated part on both the MFC and the CAC. In addition to the functions given by the CCAS, the flight warning system provides electronic checklists, which are displayed in order of priority. The AFCS, the Automatic Flight Control System, consists of a flight director and an autopilot. The heart is the flight director, which collects navigation signals and commands from the pilots, which give on the control panel. And it displays flight guidance bars on the attitude direction indicator or the artificial horizon. The flight guidance bars consist of a vertical bar giving a lateral guidance, a horizontal bar giving vertical guidance, and this is the aircraft symbol. Your task is to use the flight controls to put the little box in the crosshair and keep it there. You can also let the autopilot do the job for you. On EFIS variants, the AFCS is a separate computer and the flight director bars are magenta. 
On glass cockpit variants, the AOCS computer is integrated in the CAC, and the flight director bars are green. After an accident, investigators rely on information stored in the so-called black boxes, which are not black at all, but painted orange. They are the CVR, the cockpit voice recorder, and the FDR, the flight data recorder. They are located in the tail of the airplane and are designed to survive a crash or two. But that doesn't mean that the aircraft doesn't have black boxes. The real black boxes are the CAC, ADC, HSRS, MFC and all the other computers that account for the brain power of the aircraft. And there's more. The next black box on the list now is the FDAU, the Flight Data Acquisition Unit. The FDAU collects information from various aircraft systems, converts the signals to digital data and sends them to the flight data recorder. In addition, it sends oral recordings to the cockpit voice recorder. In 2005, after 20 years of production, ATI introduced the MPC, the multi-purpose computer. It is now the heart of the recording system and consists of two independent parts. The AFDAU, Auxiliary Flight Data Acquisition Unit, and the DMU, the Data Management Unit. The main functions of the Auxiliary Flight Data Acquisition Unit are FDAU, as described before, APM, Automatic Performance Monitoring, which is part of the ICE Protection System, and EHS, Enhanced Surveillance, which is a variant of Mode C Transponder Protocol, the other kind of protocol is called ELS. The EHS transmits aircraft parameters such as selected altitude, indicated airspeed, true airspeed, ground speed, magnetic heading, and vertical rate. And this data can, for example, be accessed by gold members of Flight Radar 24. The main functions of the DMU are 1. Provide ACMS, Aircraft Condition Monitoring System, for maintenance of the aircraft and two, copy the flight data sent to the flight data recorder to the quick access recorder. This data is stored on a storage card called PCMCIA. When an acronym ends with the letter CIA, you should pay attention. The data stored on a PCMCIA card is used in the company's flight data monitoring program which is part of the SMS, or the Safety Management System, and FOQA, Flight Operational Quality Assurance. The data is processed in a software and will produce alerts in three levels, low, medium and high, when defined thresholds are exceeded, for example, if you deviate from speed or altitude. For example, when you are on an approach and you are between 1,000 and 500 feet above the runway, and your speed exceeds the approach plus 10 for more than 5 seconds, then the alert level is low. If the speed is more than 50 knots above the approach, the alert level is medium. And if the speed is more than 20 knots above the approach, the alert level is high. This information can, when used correctly, be used to improve the standard of the pilots, for example, if there is an increased trend that the approaches are not stabilized, the company can implement corrective actions, for example, focus on this during training. In my company, the pilots are encouraged to submit a report if they suspect they may have exceeded a limitation. If they submit a report, nothing else will happen, unless it was a serious incident, of course. But if they don't report the event, they will be invited to the safety officer for a little conversation. A good flight safety program is based on a just culture. We are not punished for mistakes because we all do mistakes. But of course, gross negligence is not tolerated. Instead, we can learn from what happened and implement procedures to reduce the chance that the mistakes are repeated. Here is an example of the very opposite a punishing culture. And this is a true story. An aircraft entered the runway without clearance. There was an aircraft on final, but there were no collision risk. The company reacted by firing both pilots. 
that was in my eyes not necessary because those pilots will never do that mistake again, I promise you. Instead, this incident caused fear among the other pilots and because of that, their focus was on the wrong place and they were more likely to do mistakes. Have you heard about Bob Hoover? He was a famous test pilot and a display pilot. One of his stunts was to fly aerobatics in a Shrike Commander with both engines stopped. He also flew other airplanes such as the P-51, but the demonstration in the Shrike Commander was the most popular. And here you can see why. For all dead stick maneuvers, you have to start from enough altitude to convert your altitude into another form of energy, which is airspeed. The only thing in this particular case that you have to worry about is having enough speed on entry to complete the maneuver and then be positioned to land in the event you might not be able for some unknown reason to start the engines. In 1989, at an air show in San Diego, Bob departed with two passengers in the Shrike Commander on a Goodwill flight. At 300 feet, both engines failed. Bob managed to crash land in a ravine. The aircraft was totally damaged, but all three on board could walk away. Bob Hoover discovered that it smelled jet fuel from the wreck. It should have been gasoline. A member of the ground crew had misfueled it. When he returned to the airfield, Bob Hoover walked over to the man who had nearly caused his death and said, there isn't a man alive who hasn't made a mistake, but I'm positive you will never make this mistake again. That's why I want to make sure that you are the only one to refuel my plane tomorrow. I won't let anyone else on the field touch it. And that's all for this time. I really hope you liked it and learned a little more about aircraft avionics and safety. Please support the channel by sharing with your friends. Please click subscribe and the notification bell. Have a wonderful day and happy learning!